National Spiritual Assembly has vigorously launched the three-year plan in the United States, and the American believers are rallying to take up the challenge. In response to the initial announcement of the goals, many of the friends made immediate plans to pioneer and travel teach in the opening months of the plan. We have a goal of 2,000 individuals uh, to send into the international field, either as a traveling teacher or as a short or long-term pioneer. And I'm happy to say that the, the first year of the plan is not yet over, and we have sent 1,167 American Baha'is into the international field. 267 of them have sold their homes, have said goodbye to their families and friends, and moved to another country in the world. Baha'i youth converged on Atlanta to support a teaching project called Fruit of the Holy Year. Their infectious presentation of the teachings using a combination of modern music, dance, and drama attracted considerable attention. I just, I really think that this was an incredibly important thing, not only just to spread the word of Baha'u'llah, which I think we've done a great job doing, but to tighten all the workshops and to bring us all closer together and be more unified. Approximately 500 Baha'is participated in the 25th anniversary commemorative reenactment of the Great March on Washington at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. As growing up as a black woman, my mother talked about the march and how important it was. And this is my first march, and I said, it's about time that I see one and I feel what she felt, you know, the unity involved with this day. I think it's really important historically from a perspective of, of an African-American woman just supporting the struggle for civil rights. But as a Baha'i, it's even more important because it allows us to illustrate the unity that is the foundation of our faith. Baha'i communities from many states were represented. I'm Orod Bavar from Connecticut, and we're here today to uh, demonstrate the oneness of humankind. Well, I came this long way because I wanted to celebrate with all the other people, with the Baha'is, the 30th anniversary of Martin Luther King. I'm very happy to be here as part of uh, a great gathering and one more step on the road towards race unity. How are you? Fine. Are you enjoying yourself today? Yes. Yeah, is this a special day? Yes. Who can tell us why it's a special day? Because it's, it's the Martin Luther King's March. Well, to us, it's special because it signifies that we want to live in a united world. We want, there's one race, one world, one people. And I think in order for us to overcome so many of the problems that face the world today, we have to begin and continue to work toward that goal. The broad spectrum of Baha'i participation provides an indication of the depth and breadth of commitment to race unity activities, which is being recognized in more and more circles as a significant contribution to the improvement of race relations in the United States. Baha'is continued their emergence as leaders of the environmental movement through participation in From Rio to the Capitals, a national conference designed to carry the international initiatives established at the Environmental Summit in Rio de Janeiro to the state and local levels. And the National Assembly uh, recognized this as a tremendous opportunity to continue its involvement with others on the topic of sustainable development. And particularly, we decided that the focus that we would bring to it would be on race unity as a prerequisite to sustainable development. Dr. Robert Henderson, Secretary General of the National Spiritual Assembly, was invited by the Governor of Kentucky to speak to a session on economic and environmental equity. In the Baha'i Faith, the prophet founder of which was Baha'u'llah, we have a central belief that governs all we do. It is based on this unshakable commitment to the oneness of the human family, and it derives from a saying of Baha'u'llah, which is that the well-being of humankind, its peace and security, is unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. Thank you. It had such a profound effect on uh, the panel and among the participants that uh, he has become recognized as a 
as one of the leading spokespersons on the topic of environmental racism around the country. Mr. Speaker, we have recently received distressing reports from Iran on the continued repression of the Baha'i community, that the Tehran authorities are now destroying grave sites in the principal Baha'i cemetery in Tehran. Bodies Over a decade of continuous work by the Office of External Affairs has helped generate strong support among government leaders in defense of the Iranian Baha'i community and a new level of awareness of the faith among the leaders of the country. Vice President Al Gore was asked about the situation in Iran during a national television interview and spoke of the faith with knowledge and sympathy. We've protested. Uh, we have communicated uh, to Iran our objections to the violation of the uh, human rights of people of the Baha'i faith in Iran, uh, and we will continue doing so. You also have a lot of support in the Congress uh, on this matter. Uh, I have a deep, deep respect for uh, your faith. Uh, this is, you probably know this, Brian, many do not. Uh, the Baha'i faith is a relatively new uh, entry, entrant among the major world religions. Uh, it came really in the uh, Industrial Revolution and uh, out of the Middle East, as so many religions have. Um, and only recently, with the new government emerging in Iran, have, have they been subject to this terrible persecution uh, in Iran. And w we, uh, we stand with you, and uh, we believe that uh, the violation of uh, the human rights of your co-religionists is, uh, is really a, a crime. At the international level, work is coordinated by the human rights offices of the Baha'i International Community, which organized Baha'i participation in the United Nations Conference on Human Rights in Vienna, Austria. The Baha'i community presented three statements on human rights issues and sponsored a variety of other activities in conjunction with the conference and the associated NGO forum for non-governmental organizations associated with the United Nations. In Geneva, representatives from the Baha'i international community participated actively in subsequent hearings and deliberations regarding human rights issues. All the activities that the Baha'is can do uh, for the improvement of, of human rights or the education on human rights or, you know, overcoming racism, things like that, and that are done in collaboration of other NGOs or just, you know, known by their government, of course, is of great benefit for our work afterwards. On November 23rd, the UN Special Representative on Iran, Rinaldo Galindo Pol, reported on the present human rights situation in Iran and the continuing persecution of the Baha'i community. Representatives of the National Spiritual Assembly were seated next to two members of the Iranian UN delegation during the report, during which one of the Iranian diplomats was observed studying this appeal to the conscience of humankind which was published the previous day in the New York Times. The appeal, which was signed by three former secretaries of state, several former White House and State Department officials, and dozens of other highly respected leaders and scholars, once again called world attention to the continuing suppression and abuse of Baha'is in Iran. One week earlier, the U.S. Senate passed Concurrent Resolution 31, urging the government of Iran to emancipate the Baha'i community by granting them the rights of religious freedom provided for under international law. In the United Kingdom, publication of Olia's story, a personal account of a Baha'i woman's experience in Shiraz, has attracted media attention to the cruel injustices inflicted upon the Iranian Baha'i community. I promise to ten women in prison. If one day I will release, I will tell our story to the people of the world. Now, you were in prison for how long? I was in prison for two months. We had the many interrogation, interrogated, tortured, lot of Baha'i. They said, you must become Muslim, but they didn't deny their religion. More than 30 radio interviews and 60 newspaper articles have focused on Olia's story, including full-page stories in both the London Times and the Daily Mirror. Since last Rizvan, 
Baha'is in every country have been busy launching the new three-year plan. The hand of the cause of God, Amatul Baha Ruhiya Khanum, has been at the forefront of these efforts. Immediately following the international convention, she embarked upon a rigorous four-month trip to the republics of the former Soviet Union, accompanied by Mrs. Violet Nakchavani. Her first destination was Baku, the capital city of Azerbaijan, where Ruhiya Khanum was warmly received by the Speaker of Parliament of the Republic. Baha'is from about 15 countries attended a conference in her presence, together with the Baha'is of Baku, a community which was first established during the lifetime of Baha'u'llah. Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, was next followed by a visit to the ancient city of Samarkand. Here, as elsewhere, she met with old Baha'i families who had suffered six decades of repression and total isolation from the rest of the Baha'i world. Some had endured as much as a quarter century of imprisonment and exile in the notorious gulags of Siberia. Deprived of all literature, they still managed to keep the faith alive in their families through three generations. Traveling by land across the desert to Bukhara, Ruhiya Khanu found an active, youthful group of Baha'is. Baha'is from numerous communities in Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan gathered in the Central Asian capitals of Alma-Ata and Bishkek to welcome the hand of the cause. The Kyrgyzian Minister of Religious Affairs joined the Baha'is to meet Ruhiya Khanum at the outskirts of Bishkek. Here, as everywhere she went, she met with ministers, leading parliamentarians, scholars, and dignitaries. The media took great interest in her visit providing national coverage in newspapers, magazines, radio, and television. The city of Ashgabat, capital of Turkmenistan, has a special significance to Baha'is, the site of the first Baha'i house of worship ever built. The temple was destroyed in the 1920s, and the land where the temple once stood is now a verdant park. Ruhiya Khanum visited the site on several occasions, where some 150 believers gathered to pray together and look forward to the time when this first house of worship can be rebuilt. In two visits to Moscow, Ruhiya Khanum engaged in more than four weeks of wide-ranging activities, meeting various dignitaries, educators, artists, and leaders of thought from throughout Russia and beyond. She granted numerous interviews, which were widely reported in the press and on primetime television news. And I think that this is a very wonderful thing, that the Baha'is can help them to have a world outlook on the subject of religion, on the subject of the future of the world, uh, federated states of the world, perhaps in the next century. The Baha'is are the most progressive people in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> much. Yakutsk is the capital city of the Asian Republic of Sakha. Two members of the parliament welcomed Ruhiya Khanum upon her arrival at the airport. In a lengthy initial meeting, 
the chairman of the Supreme Soviet of the Sakha Republic expressed considerable sympathy towards the teachings of the Baha'i Faith. Thirty of the 35 members of the Sakha Parliament were present in their council chamber for a 90-minute session in which Ruhiya Khanum introduced them to the Baha'i teachings. All the teachings of the Baha'i Faith are aimed at abolishing prejudice, prejudices, helping to people to be educated and to develop mentally and spiritually. Many questions were raised, leading to an invitation to attend a second session of Parliament for a discussion that was devoted primarily to ecological issues. Government officials presented Ruhiya Khanum with flowers and other gifts, while the Minister of Ecology expressed appreciation for the Baha'i teachings, saying they were very pleased that these teachings were being spread in their country. Despite the heavy urban schedule meeting dignitaries, scholars, and reporters, Ruhiya Khanum found time to travel outside major cities and visit with residents of small towns and rural areas. These two she introduced to the teachings of Baha'u'llah, encouraging them to preserve their cultural heritage of language, dancing, music, and customs, stressing the importance of their unique contributions to a global society organized around the principle of unity and diversity. The Buryat Republic, with its capital at Ulan Ude, was the next destination. The Buryat people are predominantly Buddhist, with strong ties to Tibetan practice. Following meetings with the chairman of the Supreme Soviet and members of the Buryat Parliament, the Minister of Religious Affairs accompanied Ruhiya Khanum to visit the famous temple of Ulan Ude. Everywhere she went, Ruhiya Khanum met with the Baha'is, encouraging and teaching them, often deepening the understanding of their newfound faith. Fifteen Mongolian Baha'is traveled a great distance to meet with the Hand of the Cause, as did numerous others throughout the trip. Three members of the Buryat Parliament and a number of the resident Baha'is accompanied the Hand of the Cause on a tour of an innovative paper factory designed to operate on sound ecological principles, a question of great importance for the protection of the area's most unique environmental treasure, Lake Baikal the largest and deepest body of fresh water in the world. In Siberia, the Baha'is of the capital city of Novosibirsk welcome Ruhiya Khanum to the final destination of the eastern leg of the trip. Her meetings encompassed civic and cultural leaders, as well as an address to an audience of distinguished scientists at the city's famous center for scientific research. Highly advanced concepts of uh, life on the planet, of the meaning of life, of human beings, reality, and so on, you will find that they were developing all over the world. Historic, beautiful St. Petersburg, nearly a continent away, received a week-long visit. From here, Ruhiya Khanum launched a series of visits to the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and the Eastern European republics of Belarus and the Ukraine. A dizzying pace of meetings with officials, leaders of thought, newly formed, rapidly maturing Baha'i communities, the press and media, helped strengthen the development of the cause throughout the region.
It was the greatest achievement marking the opening of the three-year plan. 16 weeks of continuous travel covering 17 major cities in 13 separate republics of the former Soviet Union. Mrs. Violet Nakjavani, who accompanied Amatul Baha Ruhiya Khanum during the entire journey, appreciates the significance of the trip. Do you know, my friends, 50 years from now, the children who are sitting here, they will be asked to come and show us where did she come, where did she speak, show us the place she sat, tell us how did she look. This is history. so that in the future, the generations who come will have the pride and the joy of saying that, yes, she also visited our country. The seeds sown during this journey will doubtless bear fruit for generations to come. Most notable among the early responses was the request of two members of the parliament of the Sakha Republic to visit the Baha'i World Center. Upon their arrival, Mrs. Raisa Goreva and Ms. Maria Pogodayeva were escorted as pilgrims to visit the Shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel, the Shrine of Baha'u'llah at Bahji, and other Baha'i holy places. They also engaged in serious discussions with counselor members of the International Teaching Center and were welcomed by the members of the Supreme Body in the reception concourse of the seat of the Universal House of Justice. During the visit, both members of the Sakha Parliament declared their belief in Baha'u'llah and returned to their homeland to assist in shaping the great spiritual transformation of their country and the whole of human society. In October, a select group of singers from the Baha'i World Congress Choir traveled to Russia with a twofold purpose. Although their arrival in Moscow coincided with the outbreak of violent political upheaval, the choir continued with its plan to record the music of the World Congress together with one of Russia's finest symphony orchestras. The sessions were conducted in Moscow's finest symphonic recording facility with the goal of recording the highest artistic and technical quality. Following the sessions, the choir began a concert tour, including travel to Kishinev and Kiev, where the chorale was greeted with tremendous warmth and appreciation. The culmination of the tour was a concert with symphony orchestra performed at the world-famous Tchaikovsky Hall. It was the first performance of the oratorio for Baha'u'llah to a general audience. In other international news, the three-year plan in Albania was launched with an ambitious plan to inform every person in the country about the message of Baha'u'llah and its importance to the future of their country. An open letter from the National Spiritual Assembly to the people of Albania was published in newspapers, read on radio, and delivered by hand to homes throughout the country. The goal of this project is not that of increasing the number of the Baha'is in Albania. Of course, we will be having uh, new believers 
But the aim of the National Assembly was that of having the name of the faith to be spread as much as possible in the country and uh, to have Baha'is going around the country and showing with their behavior what does really the Baha'i faith mean and what a uh, fantastic uh, opportunity would be for the Albanian people to embrace the cause of Baha'u'llah. The people of this long isolated country are looking anew at the life of the spirit after decades of strict suppression. Many are rediscovering their traditional beliefs rooted in Islam and in Orthodox and Catholic Christianity. My name is Alton, I am from Albania. Before I was used to be Muslim, fanatic Muslim, but uh, I can say that I, I, I changed everything. I used to take alcohol and uh, it was so hard to change it really, to be honest, <laughs> but it happened. Really. It was so good. I find many friends. I find love, everything that I needed in that moment. The present activities are built upon several years of fruitful work at all levels of society, including seminars for prominent leaders, cultural activities, schools, media coverage, and the development of local Baha'i centers. The people of the country have responded so strongly to the teachings that the Albanian Baha'i community now numbers over 5,000, the largest of any European country. In India, Mrs. Sonia Gandhi, the widow of the assassinated Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, paid a special visit to the Baha'i House of Worship in New Delhi, where she was received by Councillor Zina Sarabji and members of the National Spiritual Assembly. In December, the House of Worship in Australia was surrounded by raging brush fires that burned for days in the area around Sydney. The temple and other Baha'i buildings escaped the devastation through the vigilance of believers who kept watch from the top of the temple dome and observed the threatening flames, which reportedly burned within 15 meters of the temple. At the Baha'i House of Worship in Wilmette, Illinois, Work was completed on a 10-year, $4.8 million restoration project designed to protect and extend the life of this unique building. The work included replacement of several sections of the monumental stairs, an addition of a second layer of tempered glass over the original skylight, sophisticated structural analysis, the cleaning and coating of the steel superstructure, complete new roofing systems, redecoration of the visitor center and thorough cleaning of all exterior and interior surfaces. The most difficult aspect of the restoration was repair of damage to structural and ornamental concrete in the crown area around the base of the dome, caused by decades of water seeping into cracks, freezing and thawing in the harsh climate, resulting in gradual deterioration of the concrete. Entire sections were removed in sequence Necessary structural repairs were completed and newly cast ornamental pieces were hoisted and fixed in place. It was very difficult for us to go up, very time consuming to go and take impressions off the building, remodel those in plaster, use clay to build it up. Very, very difficult. The project, which was completed on time and under budget, was recognized by the International Concrete Repair Institute as its project of the year the fine quality in the appearance and the quality of the craftsmanship at every area was unmatched by any other submittal. The engineering complexity and the solutions to that from both the structural design and the panel design to the hoist design was unmatched by any other submittal. Expert observers were impressed by the complex and innovative techniques that were applied to the task. They were even more impressed by the attitude of the Baha'is, who in this age of disposable commodities and instant gratification, turned away from the easier options of temporary solutions in favor of the highest quality repairs, with the intention of preserving this building for the next 1,000 years.
Nine days, 7,000 people from all faiths and many nations. Solemn spiritual convocations. Joyous celebrations of diversity. Earnest discussions. Plans and hopes for the future. It was the 1993 Parliament of the World's Religions, the largest, most comprehensive interfaith gathering ever held. The Parliament was convened in commemoration of the centenary of the 1893 World Parliament of Religions in Chicago. The original Parliament, the most memorable of several Congresses held during Chicago's World Fair, was the site of the first public mention of the Baha'i Faith in the Western Hemisphere. People of several other faith traditions also attached special significance to the original Parliament, which opened public discussion between the religions of the East and the West and is widely recognized as the starting point for interfaith dialogue in the modern world. The comprehensive program included a series of thematic plenary sessions, more than 500 major presentations, seminars, lectures, and workshops, artistic exhibits and presentations, several major symposia, and a variety of auxiliary cultural and religious events. I see when I sit here, what the future holds for us, when I look at the oneness in this room. When man realizes the supreme reality behind, to him, the whole world becomes a family. We are children of the same God, Allah, Brahman. It is incredible how much the world needs the religions. And this is why this conference is so vital in bringing you together. And I would recommend that out of this conference, we get the definition of a new world spiritual order for the next millennium. Scientists, scholars, and prominent religious and spiritual leaders were brought together in an attempt to more seriously address the critical issues facing humanity, including the environment, justice and human rights, religious conflict, population growth, and the overarching challenge of creating a peaceful world characterized by unity and diversity. Much as I question some of the teachings and practices of my own and other faiths, I firmly believe that faith traditions are essential for the human future. future. You, the leaders of our faith traditions, are the source of our inspiration for what we and Earth can be. Baha'is from Chicago were among the earliest active participants in the five-year process of planning and consultation, leading to the eventual involvement of the National Spiritual Assembly, the Baha'i International Community, and hundreds of individual Baha'is who participated in a myriad ways. Counselor Jacqueline Delahunt two members of the National Spiritual Assembly and several other Baha'is were part of the International Assembly of Religious and Spiritual Leaders, which convened for several days of discussion, calling for the establishment of a permanent parliament and individually signing the declaration entitled Towards a Global Ethic. An international press corps of more than 800 generated thousands of stories in publications all over the world. The Parliament proved to be a compelling spiritual experience for thousands of people, a witness to the widespread and deep-seated longing for the experience of oneness. As large numbers of people indicated a willingness to lay aside religious differences in order to work together for peace and human understanding, all received a tantalizing glimpse of the creative potential of unity and diversity on a global scale. A visit to Mount Carmel reveals dramatic progress in the work of the great projects on the Ark and terraces to the Shrine of the Ba. A preliminary sense of the beauty of the new terraces is beginning to emerge as workers begin to develop some of the gardens on the new terraces. 6,000 square meters of sod were grown on a farm outside the city and then moved to the terraces just below the shrine in time to take proper root before the rainy season set in. Trees from the ancient olive grove, temporarily removed for safekeeping, have been returned now that the mountain has been reshaped to the contours of the terraces. Dramatic changes have taken place on the terrace level of the shrine itself. 
This terrace has been extended in the direction of the Pilgrim House, and entirely new gardens have been created, opening new, unobstructed views of the shrine and adding to the grandeur of the main terrace. Concealed beneath the terrace extension is a new five-story storage and maintenance building that will house many of the service functions that the area will require. Development of these elegant gardens, replete with a variety of delicate flora, is proceeding in the midst of continuing massive earthwork operations. This is a very difficult combination of activities to maintain simultaneously, but both must proceed in order to meet the established construction deadlines and keep the projects on schedule. The size of the project, stretching farther than the eye can see, from the foot of the mountain to the very top, is difficult to comprehend. Here, stonemasons are adding natural stone facing to the retaining wall along Abbas Street, midway up the lower terraces. 2,000 square meters of stone must be shaped and placed by hand just for the walls and bridge of this single terrace. Work is also proceeding rapidly on the highest terraces, numbered 14 through 19, where the mountainside is even steeper. Multiple retaining walls are required in this area where the work is especially difficult and dangerous. At the same time, in other areas on the mountain, extensive work has been done to prepare for the construction of the remaining buildings on the Ark. The modest exterior appearance of these buildings conceal their true size, most of which is hidden within the mountainside. Preparation for these buildings has required massive excavations, going down as far as 10 stories through solid rock. Excavation and preparation of the site for the center of the study of the sacred texts and the extension of the archives has been completed. On December 19th, the general contracts for these two buildings were signed in Haifa, clearing the way for construction to commence. On the other side of the ark, excavation work continues at the site of the International Teaching Center. Slow and tedious methods have been employed to minimize the disturbance to people living in nearby buildings. A high wall constructed of micropiles and rock anchors stabilizes the mountain and will protect the building. The Baha'i projects are of great interest to the city of Haifa. The new mayor, Mr. Amram Mitzna, recently visited the World Center together with a number of other municipal officials. The two-hour visit provided the opportunity for an intensive presentation on the Baha'i projects, which are widely acknowledged to be of great significance to the future of the city. Taken together, these great projects far outstrip anything the Baha'i world has attempted to date. On October 31st, the Universal House of Justice informed all national spiritual assemblies that completion of the Mount Carmel projects is the most challenging and urgent priority in the Baha'i world at this time, that the time for completion of these projects is now. There is no doubt that providing the $74 million needed for these projects while sustaining the support needed by the other funds of the faith is one of the great challenges facing the Baha'i community during the three-year plan. A spiritual challenge calling for new levels of unity and sacrifice. In order to provide support for the Ark and Terraces projects and to win the challenging goals of the three-year plan, the National Spiritual Assembly has been busy preparing initiatives in a number of areas. At the center of all the plans is Vision in Action, a program designed as a call to service for every individual believer. Growth is too slow. The program was launched nationwide on November 14th, following intensive planning and training sessions involving believers from every electoral district in the country. We cannot meet the financial obligations of this community as we currently have them, not even talking about new ones, nor can we respond to the needs of the House of Justice in our current condition. That, in essence, is the crisis. 
The message of the National Spiritual Assembly was delivered directly to the believers through hundreds of special meetings. We feel ourselves to be the most incompetent people to have inherited this great message of Baha'u'llah. And we're struggling with all kinds of complicated problems, but let me tell you what the bottom line of this is. The bottom line is that we've got to, as national and local spiritual assemblies, provide people with a foundation of life which is so loving and which is so encouraging and which is so nurturing and which inspires such confidence in myself and my own capacity to go out and do that I go out and take the risk to be different, to buck the tide, to stand up and be just, and to extend a helping hand even to the enemy, Abdu'l-Bahá says. The American believers were quick to respond, and there was an immediate upswing in teaching plans, in contributions to the fund, and in all areas of Baha'i activity. My first initial reaction is that I have to forget myself and go out and teach. I have to forget the incompetence that I feel, the ineptness in myself, um, and trust that Baha'u'llah and the Concourse will assist me. You know, the, it, it's really kind of struck a chord. It is kind of selfish. You kind of hold back, you know, in, in your teaching efforts sometimes. Uh, one, uh, partly because of fear. Others because perhaps, you know, you feel that you might be rejected. But you just got to go out and do it. It's got to be done now. It's, uh, it's imperative. It's, I mean, the future of the world is at stake. It's not just me as an individual anymore. It's the world. What do you think? I need to go home right now and invite all of the people who I love very dearly and the people that I have told about Baha'u'llah in the workplace, at home, the people I meet through my children, I need to invite them to become Baha'is. <laughs> Inspired, uh, I'm set on fire. As the vision and action meetings were summoning the believers to arise, the National Spiritual Assembly convened a landmark meeting at the Lou Helen Baha'i School to plan the strategy for one of the loftiest goals of the plan, to raise up the first generation of children free from racial prejudice. We brought together some folks this weekend from across the country, people who are not only members of agencies of the National Spiritual Assembly, but also folks who've worked with programs, programs focused on children. That a core curriculum for children had to be a process, a process that begins in the heart of the community that begins with the primary teachers, the parents, and is emphasized by the raising of the station of teachers of children. So everything that is done in the Youth Institute is with the goal of enhancing the spirituality of the individual youth. The focus of workshop which people never really understand is discipline, concentration, and control. The arts are just an expression of those, uh, those learned uh, capacities and abilities. Uh, o son of man, noble have I created thee, yet thou hast abased thyself. Rise then unto thou, thou wast created. Baha'u'llah said that. And from there we started um, classes, and we called them the nobility classes. What they're doing is sharing with us those programs, and in turn, we're listening to discern those key factors which will enable us to craft a still larger strategy that will aim towards the accomplishment of this goal, the raising of the first generation of children free of prejudice and truly united. At the same time, leading Hispanic Baha'is from many backgrounds gathered in Wilmette to consult on their special role in the three-year plan. Primarily, our business here is to discuss what we need to do in terms of reaching the Latino population of this country and achieving the massive expansion called for by the Universal House of Justice at the beginning of the three-year plan. And we can achieve a common vision of the spiritual conquest of this planet. Our contribution in one way is, how can we as believers with Latin American roots, taking part in teaching activities with Latin Americans, create an environment of attraction in the communities where we live. The National Spiritual Assembly, through its Office of Pioneering, 
has organized Pioneer Emphasis Days in cities all across America to encourage the believers to arise for this most meritorious service. The Guardian has stated that the most important service anyone can render is to teach the cause of God. There are areas of priority. The first is the virgin areas of the world where no Baha'is have set foot. The second is the area of consolidation of goals that we have already won in the field abroad. The third are the home front goals here in the United States. The small staff of the Office of Pioneering is working hard to facilitate the movement of teachers and pioneers to virtually every corner of the planet. The Universal House of Justice has asked the U.S. Baha'i community to raise up 2,000 long and short-term pioneers and traveling teachers in the three-year plan. And what that boils down to is two people per day for every day of the plan. Over 600 people attended the North American Baha'i Conference on Social and Economic Development in Orlando, Florida. Participants brought a wide variety of development experience to the discussions on how to stimulate positive development activities in the areas of race unity, family cohesion, the role of women, education, health, the environment, and the rights of indigenous peoples. Learning to apply the teachings to achieve, so, to achieve progress could be taken as the very definition of Baha'i social and economic development. The Rabani Charitable Trust, which together with Mataheta Development Services sponsored the conference, presented a special award to Dr. David Rue, retired member of the Universal House of Justice, and his wife Margaret, in recognition of their many years of interest and involvement with development projects in many parts of the world. Abdul Baha said it, and I have espoused it. Abdul Baha said that service to mankind is my perpetual religion. Service to mankind is my perpetual religion. Allahu Akbar. Workshops were organized to share experiences and success stories in order to gain a deeper understanding of the principles of Baha'i development and to formulate action plans to achieve the development goals of the three-year plan. The single most powerful tool for social and economic development is spiritual, not technical. We want to talk, I would like to suggest that we talk about what services we can render to strengthen the family and marriage, which is the sort of rock on which the family is built. The most recent step in this great mobilization of the American Baha'i community took place in Atlanta, Georgia, where 1,000 Baha'is from communities throughout the southern states gathered for the purpose of initiating the process of large-scale growth. Today, we begin a new chapter in the history of the development of the faith in the United States. The task before us demands a large, the tasks before us demand a large increase in the numbers of Baha'is simply because the opportunities that confront us, the things that the faith can do, the influence it can exercise on the government and the people of the United States is enormous. And we simply don't have the people and we don't have the funds to exercise that influence. Doors are open and there's nobody to walk through those doors. In order to fulfill the tasks which Baha'u'llah has placed on us in the next, let's say, 10 years, we need at least to double the size of our community. And I would say, optimally, we should have I'm pulling figures out of the air. Anybody can dispute them. But my personal feeling is we need about a million Baha'is in the next 10 years.
Councilors Wilma Ellis, Stephen Berkland, and William Roberts were present, together with all nine members of the National Spiritual Assembly, the National Teaching Committee, and the Auxiliary Board members for the Southern States, in a unified effort to initiate the long-awaited expansion. That means that we must love each other so much so that we want to help each other along. If someone is teaching, you pray for that person. Even if he's saying the wrong thing, because but how long will write that wrong? You don't have to do it. I've seen it happen. The weekend was designed to assemble the believers, to consult in area groupings to formulate specific plans for each state, and most importantly, to engage in teaching the faith to the people of Atlanta. We're gathered here together in the spirit of the oneness of the human family. That is a spirit that is eluding most of the human family worldwide. It is so important when we come together. Public meetings large and small and a full roster of firesides throughout the Atlanta area attracted seekers from many strata of society. For all who attended, there was a clarion call to action. The result? a fresh determination to raise the cry of the kingdom. Shall the soldiers of the South now rise, this time to serve in the army of God, what shall your answer be? Yes, Baha'u'llah. Shall you not arise now and enter the battlefield? Yes, Baha'u'llah. From the Ozarks of Arkansas to the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina. Yes, Baha'u'llah. From the shores of Savannah to the mighty Mississippi. Yes, Baha'u'llah. From the bowels of Louisiana to the sunny beaches of Florida. Yes, Baha'u'llah. From the hollows of Kentucky to the mighty volunteers of Tennessee. Yes, Baha'u'llah. And from the lowlands of South Carolina to the bloodstained streets of Selma, Alabama. Yes, Baha'u'llah. Wherever there is a single soldier of the Lord raising the battle cry in the South, whatever the sacrifice, let the cry be, Yes, Baha'u'llah! Yes, Baha'u'llah! Yes, Baha'u'llah! Yes, Baha'u'llah! Yes, Baha'u'llah! Yes, Oh, my God. 